Our God and our Father, we bless your name because we're here again together. We're here to study your word. We're here to examine our lives. We're here to ask you of the words of this life. We're here to ask you of your purpose, your plan for our very lives. We pray that as we're here today, your spirit will speak directly to our hearts in Jesus' name. And we pray that your plan and purpose for each of our lives will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm talking on church growth. I'm talking on the life of the pastor. 
who wants to be involved in church growth. If the church will grow, if the work the Lord has committed into our hands will grow and develop as it ought to be, as it was in the New Testament, the people involved must be some special type of men. Another reason we're looking into this is because I know there are people in this congregation. You are saved, you are following after the Lord, you have followed after the Lord in getting sanctified, and you got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and the desire of your heart is to be used of God. But you see, that is not an idle dream. To be used of God is a great thing, a great responsibility. And you want to know the type of man, the type of woman you ought to be if the Lord is going to pick on you and the Lord is going to use you. Follow me. There are people here. Apart from the fact that you desire to be used of God, apart from the fact that you are involved in the work of God, maybe the Lord has even called you. The Lord has already told you he wants you to be used of him. And then you're waiting upon the Lord. You're saying, oh Lord, I want to carry out your will. I want to be used of you. But just what type of man, what type of woman will you be if you are going to be used of God? Then we have a number of workers in our midst. And we have men and women who, have, who are carrying great responsibilities in this church. And you want to check off from the word of God. If the Lord will use you like he used the people in the New Testament, what type of man, what type of woman will you be? That is why I'm studying with you on the man behind church growth. That is the type of minister, the type of leaders that are involved with a growing church. I want to read to you from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. Here we have the mention of the name of a man. His name is Peter. He was involved with the growth of the early church. I'll be talking to you more about him and people like him. Now, in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and of power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. That's another man. You've heard the mention of the name of Peter. God used him. You are now hearing the mention of the name of Stephen. God used him among the people. I'm looking at chapter 8 of Acts. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and he preached Christ unto them. That is another man in the New Testament age, the New Testament time, that got involved in the move of the Holy Ghost, in the work of God, in the growth of the church, and the Lord used him mightily. In Acts chapter 9, verse 27, But Barnabas took him, and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them, how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. In verse 31, then at the church's rest, throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. There you are introduced to another man in the early church by the name of Paul the Apostle. There are other men that we can read about in the New Testament. These men were involved with the growth of the early church. 
but it's sufficient to just reveal or to just mention these four to you, Peter, Stephen, Philip, and Paul. These men were not ordinary men. These men were not just a casual men. These men were the people that determined they were going to be used of God in their own generation. Men who were mightily used of God to fulfill his purpose, his plan in their generation were men after God's own heart. You remember David? The Bible refers to him as a man after God's own heart. Talking to Samuel, he said, I have found David, a man after my own heart. And if you are going to be used of God, if you are going to be used in any significant way in the growth of the church, in the development of the work of God, you must be a man after God's own heart. Elijah was referred to as a man of God. And that wasn't just a title. By the very nature of his character, his courage, his charisma, his very life, his ministration, he merited the title, man of God. He was truly and wholly, consistently, constantly a man of God. And people who are going to be used today in private and in public must be able to answer to that name, to that title, or to those words, man of God. That means he has a good relationship with God, is maintaining that relationship with God, and his life is not tarnished with sin. Elisha was recognized and identified as an holy man of God. His life, his personality, commanded respect. Just to see him live, just to see him pray, just to see him read his Bible, just to see him declare the words of the Lord. The people that saw him, they knew that he was holy, they knew that he was a man, not a man of society, not a man of popularity, not a man that people could toss here and there. He was a solid man of God, stable and sound and steadfast, and he was holy. David, a man after God's own heart. Elijah, a man of God. Elisha, a holy man of God. You know what the Bible says about Daniel? He was preferred above presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was found in him. Those were the men of ages gone by, generations gone by, that God used in a mighty way. And as we come to the New Testament, we're introduced to John the Baptist. And the way the, the Apostle John, in John chapter 1 verse 6, introduced John to us is, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. A man sent from God. A man that comes to the public, coming out of the very presence of God. Are you like that? You know many times there are people in the church who complain. And they say, well, I like to be useful to God. I really mean business. I want to serve the Lord. I want to do this. I want to do that. Now let me ask you this question. Can you be said to be a man that is sent from God? Anytime you appear before the public, anytime you want to minister to the people, will the people be able to recognize you are coming right from the presence of God? By your very life, by your attitude, by your character, by your behavior, by your spiritual authority, by everything that comes out of you and through you. Are you a man sent from God? Paul the Apostle, when God was talking to Ananias, he said, He is a chosen vessel unto me, a chosen vessel to carry precious ointment, anointing, and treasure, a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, before the kings, and before the children of Israel. Have you been chosen as a vessel of honor? Are you known by God, recognized by God as such a vessel? Does your vessel carry a precious ointment, anointing, as well as authority from the very presence of God? These were the people of years gone by that God himself laid the, his hands upon and he used them. And Nicodemus came to Jesus Christ. And he had this testimony to say about Jesus, Thou art a teacher come from God. Think about it. David, a man after God's own heart. 
Elijah, a man of God. Elisha, a holy man of God. Daniel, a man in whose spirit there is an excellent spirit. John, a man sent from God. Paul, a chosen vessel. Jesus, a teacher come from God. Where do you stand? It's not an idle dream. It's not just say, well, I want to be used of God. But you see, where do you stand? Are you a man coming right from the presence of God when you appear in the public? Do the angels of God know you like that as a real man of God? Your neighbors, the people around you, can they tell by your character? Can they tell by your behavior? Can your wife tell? Can your husband tell that you are really sent from God? Listen to me. God will only show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards sin. Do you know that today many churches like to grow? In fact, I, I do not know any church that doesn't want to grow. Every church wants to grow. Grow in number, grow spiritually, grow in the authority, grow in the way they command respect in the community. But what are they looking for to make them grow? They're looking for nice messages, novel methods, new machines, notable meetings. But you know, God is not interested in just the messages, the methods, the machines, and the meetings is looking for men every time from the time of the creation God has been looking for men men that will stand in the gap men that will be trusted men that will be that something worthy will be committed into their hands and as you look through your Bible God created Adam and through Adam, he wanted to fulfill his goal. He wanted a man, not a method, not a message, not a machine, not methodology. And it is not just meeting. No, it's a man that God was looking for. Adam failed God. God picked on Noah. Because that was a man that found grace in the sight of God. God is looking for men. When the time of Noah passed by, God cho chose Abraham. And when he chose Abraham, he said, I know him. I know that he will teach his household my commandment. And therefore, I can bear my heart before him. I can tell him my very will, my word. And after Abraham, God chose Isaac. Always he has been looking for men. And there, later he chose Jacob. And later he found Joseph, a man that was faithful, a man that will not defile himself with sin. And you know, he found Moses at the backside of the desert. And he called his name, Moses, Moses, I've seen the affliction of my people. Come, I will send you to them that you may deliver them. And after uh, Moses, he found Joshua, a servant of Moses, that closely followed Moses everywhere he went. And the Lord told Moses, you lay your hand upon him and let your spirit come upon him because he is the one that will lead my people into the land of Canaan. And after the time of Joshua, he found the judges. Always, always finding a man. I'm telling you that God prefers the man before the method. God is wanting to use the man rather than the machines. God is wanting to use you as an equipment to, to, to bring forth his glory rather than just wanting to have a technical, mechanical, electronics equipment. He's looking for the man. God doesn't annoy the loudspeaker. You understand that even though the loudspeaker is very useful in the church, no anointing ever comes on the loudspeaker. The anointing comes upon the man. The instruments we use in the church, the machines we use in the church, God doesn't anoint those machines. He anoints the men. And if the men will give themselves to the Lord and they will surrender themselves to the Lord, it is the men that God himself is looking for. And you know that many, many churches... All they're looking for is just to acquire machines and machinery and uh, methods and you, they want nice messages. And they feel that if the messages are there, sometimes uh, they copy them from books and read them out. God doesn't work like that. But you know, if you will just surrender yourself to the Lord and you say, here am I. I know you're looking for men. I consecrate myself. I present myself. The Lord will use you. I told you, he used the judges. Then he called Saul. And he said, I'm choosing him a captain for my people. But you know, Saul soon took a wrong step. And uh, God told Samuel, he said, why are you weeping all the night? For Saul, I've rejected him, but I've found another man. 
in the house of Jesse. His name is David. He is a man after my own heart. After my own heart. God always, always, always looking for men. And he chose the prophets. And he sent them daily. Rising up early and sending them to the people that they should hear the word of the Lord. And as the time of the prophets came to an end, the angel came to um, Zechariah and said, The Lord has answered your prayer. God is going to give a man to Israel so that the light of salvation will come out in Israel. And you will call his name John. And Zechariah doubted and said, How shall these things be, seeing that we are old? And he said, I'm an angel coming right from the presence of the Lord. Because you have not believed it, you will be dumb until the child is born. And John was born eventually, and he was a strange person because he just was clinging to the Lord cleaving to the Lord and when he started preaching everybody came to the wilderness God had found a man a man in the wilderness and make straight the way of the Lord and after that Jesus Christ came the son of the highest the son of the Holy One the son of God God always looking for a man and you know when Jesus had all those multitudes following after him we are told that in the night he went for all night prayer and when the morning came he chose listen to me he chose the 12 disciples that they should be with him because he will send them out to heal the sick to preach the gospel to raise the dead always God has been looking for men and Saul of Tarsus was going on the way to Damascus and suddenly the light shone around him and he heard the voice of the Lord Jesus also why persecutest thou me who art thou Lord I am Jesus whom thou persecutest what shall I do go to Damascus it shall be shown you what you will do and God went to Ananias and said Ananias go to the street that is called straight and you will find a man there I have got him he's going to bear my name he's going to bear my glory he's going to bear my word before the Gentiles God has found another man again and it is that man that went to the Roman Empire is that man that went to polluted and corrupted Corinth is that man that went to the province of uh, Asia is that man that went to Galicia is that man that said God has raised me up a teacher to the Gentiles God has found a man again do you see as I'm showing you in the Bible that all this time God is not just looking for machines or machinery God is not just looking for methods he's looking for men and if you can surrender yourself and give yourself as a man before God saying oh Lord here am I here am I you are going to use me then the Lord will use you because the church will grow not on the basis of messages alone methods alone machinery alone meetings alone the church is going to grow if we have new and renewed men another problem in the church is that many churches feel if we have more money our church will grow they say well all that is hindering us is just a lack of funds lack of money but listen to me churches want more money god needs mature men all the time it's not a substitute. There is nothing you can use to replace the man. God is looking for men that will carry on his work. God needs men. Men who are saved. Men who are zealous. Men who are self-denying and self-emptying. Men who are clothed with humility, wise as serpents, harmless as doves, simple as children, compassionate as a savior, strong in faith, not staggering at the promise of God. Those are the men that God is looking for. And if he can find them, he will do mighty things through them. You remember that Peter writing to the elders, he said, you must be closed with humility. Do you remember Jesus sending out his own disciples saying, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of the wolves, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Do you remember Jesus bringing up a little child and bringing him, bringing that little child before his disciples and he said, except you be converted and you become as this little child, you'll not even be able to get into that kingdom. And if you are not able to get into that kingdom, how can you work for the growth and development of that kingdom? We must be simple as children and compassionate as the Savior. And we're told about Abraham, a man that followed after God, that he was strong in faith. Because he was strongly persuaded that what God has said is able to perform and he staggered not at the promise of God. Really, you know, it's the man that is approved of God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, that is needed today. If God finds such a man, anywhere you find such a man that I've been describing to you now, 
is the authority of his faith, the authority of his prayer can lock and unlock, bite and lose. Is truly a man of God whose soul is ever following after the Lord as the heart panters after the brook. So my heart panters, longer desires, follows after you, Lord my God. Those are the men that are really zealous for the Lord. They say, Give me just the presence of God, the power of God. That is all I want. All else in the world I want to do without. All I need is God upon my life. His eye is single to God. He has the right motive to please the Lord all the time. He is crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to him. He is energized by the Spirit, and rivers of living water flow unhindered out of his innermost being. He is truly the temple of the Holy Ghost, with the fruits and the gifts of the Spirit in evidence. He is constantly keeping his first love to God, his first love to Christ, to the church, and to mankind. He is fully consecrated to God, and, and he consecrates his service to the Lord. He binds his sac sacrifice upon the altar. That is the man God will use. And you know there are many people that say, well, I've been long in this church. My brother, my sister, it's not the number of years you keep in the church. It's how devoted, how dedicated, how consecrated, how yielded and surrendered, submitted to God you are. You know, some people say, well, I've been so long here. And I was saved, and I did such and such. God is not looking for men of history. He's looking for men of anointing. It's not looking for men that can say, well, I was saved at such a time long, long ago. It's looking for men who are still having their sacrifice upon the altar. It's not by seniority, it's by spirituality. It's not because I've been there for a long time. Therefore, oh yes, the Lord has to use me because I've been there for a long time. How spiritual are you? How sincere are you? How devoted are you? How consecrated are you? How are you sacrificing, consecrating yourself to the Lord? How closely following after the Lord are you? How satisfied are you with the presence of the Lord and His power alone? That's what God is looking for. There is no cheap and easy way to make the church grow. The minister or the member who will be used in a growing church must be yielded in God's hand as the clay in the potter's hand. He's always busy. Like Jesus, he must be about his father's business. Like Isaiah, the coal of fire has been taken from up the altar of God and it has touched his leaves. And because the coal, the live coal from the altar of God has touched his leaves, he is purged, he is inflamed, he is renewed, he is sanctified, he is anointed, he is empowered. He prays and he praises, he speaks and he sings, he cannot be quiet. The word of God is inside him and whenever he opens his mouth, the Lord fills him with power, with authority, with anointing, with conviction. Raising up a growing church is not the work of lazy, selfish, careless, and different worldly men. Sometimes the man that is used of God in the growing church is with the Lord all night in prayer. Many times, rising up a great while before the day, he prays and he waits upon the Lord. Daily, he gives himself continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world. My brother, my sister, there is a price to pay. It is to such men that I've been, talk that I've been talking about now. It is to such men that God can commit the keys of his kingdom. God is a serious God. God doesn't joke. God doesn't play. God is very serious about the salvation of souls. And the keys into the kingdom are precious in the sight of God. And God cannot give the keys of that kingdom into the hands of men and women that are lazy, selfish, careless, indifferent, and worldly. But when God will see a man that is really on the altar, a man that is surrendered to the Lord, a man that is saying, Oh God, all I want is you to fill me, to saturate me, to overflow from me. When God can get such a trustworthy, a trusted man, a trusted woman, he can commit the keys of the kingdom. And if you are going to be a man like that, if you are going to be a woman like that, you need eight things, at least eight things in your life. Prayer, Purity, power, persuasion, 
preaching, purpose, perception, principles. What I'm saying is this. If you are going to be mightily used of God to build up the church, to raise up the church, that the church will grow by your involvement, by your participation, you must be a man of secret prayer. You must be a man of searching purity, a man of supernatural power, a man of strong persuasion, a man of scriptural preaching, a man of saintly purpose, a man of spiritual perception, a man with sound principles. But you know, if we're so lazy, if we're so careless, that we do not seriously follow hard after the Lord, and we just say, well, I wish God will use me. I hope God will use me. My brother, my sister, it doesn't work like that. Being used of God doesn't come to the lazy, indolent, indifferent fellow that, you know, will not even take the word of God seriously. You know you cannot deceive God. And if God doesn't give you the key to open the doors to the Gentiles to come into the kingdom, you can never open the door. You may have all the methods. You may write up the messages. You may have the machinery and the methodology. You may have the administration. And you may be able to even, by public effort, by promotional effort, be able to gather people together into large, great meetings. You will never be used of God. God doesn't toy with the keys of the kingdom. God doesn't play with the keys of the kingdom. It is to those who are always on their knees. It is to those who are sweating and crying and calling upon God. It is to those who are consecrated and, and seriously yielded to God. It is to those who care for nothing of this world, but care for God alone. It is to only those people the Lord can commit the keys of the kingdom. Don't kid yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Any minister in the, in the deeper Christian life ministry, you know the Lord is not just watching for the name Deeper Christian Life Ministry. I hope you are intelligent enough to know that. That the Lord is not saying, well, because it's deeper life, even though he's careless, even though he doesn't pray, even though he's not having a strong persuasion, even though he's not really following a hand after me, just because it's deeper life, that because of that I will use him, there is nothing like that. You can be called by whatever name, apostle or bishop. You can be called by whatever name, superintendent or coordinator. Whatever the name is, if you do not have the secret prayer, always on your knees, you will never amount to anything before the Lord. But you know, there are so many people, and they're in this church. All they know is that, well, we started it together. We're old, old members. If you have eyes to cry, you should cry for yourself when you find yourself in that situation. Only saying that, well, I've been there all the time. I've been an old member there. God will just set you aside if you cannot get on your knees by secret praying and say, oh Lord, let your fire come upon me because I want to be used of you in this growing church. God will rather raise up a stone to declare his glory. God will rather use the jawbone of an ass. God will rather use a little David. And God will rather bring a Joseph from the prison to come and declare the glory of his name and to convert people to him. Rather than use a person who is just sitting in the church warming the bench and is not serious to follow after the Lord. If you are going to be used of God, you cannot take God for a ride. You cannot play with the things of God. You have to get on your knees and be a man of secret prayer. That's the point I'm making in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. You want to be used of God? You must be a man of prayer. Secret prayer. A man that is always on his knees. A man that knows how to contact heaven. A man that intercedes. A man that prays. I don't mean there's a type of public praying that people do. You, you find people that pray in public. And they pray long prayer, loud prayer. And they try to use some type of vocabulary in their prayer. Those are hypocrites. If you do not have the closet praying, if your knees are not bended, when you are in your closet, if you are not all the time with strong crying and tears, with real devotion and affection, calling upon the Lord in secret, if you come in the public to do anything, it's just hypocrisy. God is not going to take you serious. But you know, when you are a man of secret prayer, and you are seeking after the Lord, and you know, the more you pray, the more you are humble. 
the more you go down, the more you are crucified, the more you are just nailed to the cross, the more you bind your, your sacrifice on the altar, the more the tears will be flowing, the more your heart will be softened, the more you'll have the vision of heaven, the more you'll be hearing of the purpose, the plan of God. If you're a man of prayer, and you will never be tired, a man that is praying, a man that is waiting upon the Lord, the body may be tired, but his spirit is always awake. Call him at any time. He has authority over the devil, over sickness. He has authority anywhere. Anywhere you put him, you can put him in the jungle. He can preach the gospel. You can put him in a particular state. He can preach the gospel. You can put him in a city. He'll be holding meetings and he will be, he'll be drawing multitudes to the Lord. If he's a man of secret prayer, if there's a one that cannot pray, that will say, well, my station is difficult, my state is peculiar, my local government area will not yield to the gospel, our city is so worldly, they will not listen to the preaching of the gospel. My brother, my sister, is because you are lazy, you cannot pray. Because God still holds the world in his hand. And he can move the hearts of men to, to obey the gospel, and it will find the right man. If we'll find the right man, the kneeling man, the praying man, if we'll find the supplicating man, the interceding man, that man can go anywhere and preach the gospel with wonderful results, and many people will turn to the Lord. And Jesus spake this parable unto them, to this saying, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Let me ask you, are you a man of prayer? Secret prayer? Have you ever waited all night like Jesus, just praying? Do you wake up many times early in the morning, a great while before the day, calling upon the Lord? Do you burst your message in prayer? Listen to me, the letter killers. And a prayerless message will kill, will destroy. It may be all right. It may be so orderly. And the vocabulary, the English may be all right. The theology may be sound. But if it is a message, not burst with prayer, it will kill. Because it's a dead man's message. When you are not praying, when you are not waiting upon the Lord, the message is not going to convict the sinner. The message is not going to convert. The message is not going to draw sinners to the Lord. It is when you burst that message in prayer. When the foundation of the message is prayer. When the preparation of the message is prayer. When you anoint it with the prayer. When you wet it with the prayer. When your tears and the dew of heaven, when they mix together before that message, it is such messages will come to the public and declare it and people will fall on their faces and call upon the Lord. But you know, if we're not doing that, if all we just, many of you leading our fellowship, listen to me. If uh, all you do is just take the outline in your hand, no tears coming out of your eyes, no burden in your heart, no vision in your soul, all you do is just take an outline and you come to preach, nobody is going to get converted. But the people that can get people converted are the people that are kneeling down in the night like John Knox and they are saying, give me Scotland or I die. And within them, they are pregnant with the souls yet unborn, souls yet unregenerated and say, oh God, oh God, just give me the hearts of these people. They are like Elijah kneeling down saying, oh God, let the minds of these people be turned unto you. Send the fire upon the sacrifice. You know, if you are not a man of secret prayer like that, a woman of secret prayer like that, you may preach, there will be no conversion. You may work, there will be no growth and development. You may counsel, there will be no result, there will be no fruit. You may pray, there will be no answer because all you are praying is just a public praying. You don't have the secret praying within the closet. Number two, not only men of secret prayer, but men of searching purity. Listen to me. I didn't just say men of purity. I said men of searching purity. Uh, you know, there is a type of purity that a man who wants to be used of God will want to get. It's a type of transparent purity. There is no hypocrisy. There is no show. There is no pretense. There is nothing that is trying to give a false image. It is a type of purity. It is white hot. Hot white. It is something that has gone into the fire, tried seven times, and the soul is purified under the sanctifying blood of Jesus Christ. He has, he has seen the vision of the Lord. But the, because the Bible says in the year that Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord and I heard, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Then I said, woe is me, and I'm undone because I'm a man of uncleanness, and I dwell in the midst of people on, of uncleanness. Then flew an angel uh, before the presence of the Lord and took a coal from the 
the altar of God and touched my lips. And he said, your sins are purged. Your sin is taken away. Your iniquity is taken away. And it is after that the Lord said, who shall I send? Who shall go for us? And Isaiah that is now purified and sanctified. Isaiah that is now cleansed and is totally yielded to the Lord. He said, here am I, send me. But you know, if you are not sanctified, if you are not purified, if all your purity is a deeper life dressing, a deeper life facial appearance, a deeper life type of a sanctimonious attitude, but you know, there is all evil, evil thoughts inside you. You don't have the real cleansing, the love in the heart, the purity, the one that every, somebody can look at you and see that this is a sincere soul. This one is, a, is, I mean, a searching purity. This one is really sanctified. You know, if you do not have that, throw away the idea of being used of God. Because hypocrites can never be used in a mighty way before the Lord. You must be sincere. And the purity that God gives you must be searching purity. Listen to Paul. How holily, justly, unblameably we have walked before God and before you. Listen to the promise that was given through Zacharias that God will grant us to be delivered from all our enemies and that he will help us, he will make us to be holy in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. Listen to John the Apostle as he said, as he is, so are we even now. Listen to Jesus as he said, be ye perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Listen to Peter as he reiterated, be holy because I, the Lord your God, I am holy. That's what I'm talking about. When you are purified, when you are sanctified and your heart is totally clean, there is no secret sin, there is no evil in the recesses, in the secret of your heart, you are just open, you are frank before the Lord and the Lord can look at you and, and, and direct you to Satan. Satan, have you seen my servant Job? Have you seen my servant so and so that there is no man on the face of the earth like him because he runs away from evil. He's a perfect man and the devil will not be able to argue against that. He may give an excuse but he cannot argue about against the searching purity of your own life. My brother, my sister, when your purity is like that, when your life is like that and you know you are really sincere before the Lord and the Lord has purified you and sanctified you and made you holy and the Lord can testify to it, you will be used mightily of God because you are a man of such impurity. You must be a man of secret prayer. You must be a man of such impurity. You must be a man of supernatural power. Go through your Bible very well. From the time of Abraham, to the time of uh, Moses, to the time of Joshua, to the time of Elijah, to the time of Elisha, to the time of Isaiah, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, Paul, Peter, John, Stephen, Philip. Go through all the Bible. You'll find that they had power. The power of God. The power of God. And if you are going to be used today, my brother, my sister, you must consider this. You must not only be men of prayer, you must not only be men of purity, you must be men of supernatural power. Your own weakness must be exchanged with his power, with his nature. Because the Bible says he shall receive power, supernatural power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now listen to me. It's easy to just have a snapshot prayer. Five minutes. Thank you, Jesus. I take it by faith. Now, if you are given something, you take it by faith, you have it. If you have not been given something, if you have not dug deep, if you have not consecrated, if you have not yielded yourself, if you take it by faith when God has not given you, you have nothing. My brother, my sister. This is not something you just cajole yourself, you deceive yourself. This is not something you just say, well, I think I've got it. You can't think you have got it if you have not got it. Because, you know, if you have really got it, the devil is going to challenge you. If you have really got it, Pharaoh is going to challenge you. If you have really got it, Herod is going to challenge you. If you have really got it, Nebuchadnezzar is going to challenge you. If you have really got it, the magicians, the sorcerers are going to challenge you. And if you've got it, they will know you have got it. You know what the magician said about Moses? They told Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Moses really got something. 
You know what uh, Rahab said about Joshua and about the people of Israel? He said, I know. We know here. God has given this land into your hand. You know what they sang about David? They said Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousand. You know what they said about Daniel? Uh, Daniel was called and he said, I have heard of you. That the spirit of the almighty God is upon you. You know what uh, they said about uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? He said, there is no God that can deliver after this sort. Because I see the fourth one as a son of the living God, as a son of God. You know what they said about uh, Jesus Christ? We know that you have a truth, a teacher come from God. You know what they said about Paul? They wanted to sacrifice to them thinking that they are God. Some bad numbers. You know what they said about uh, Peter? They got people to the street so that the shadow of Peter, overshadowing them, might heal some of them. You know, if you have really got the power, people will know. People will recognize. It is not something we can just, you know, take it for granted. Thank God I've got it. Thank God I've got it. If you are going to be used of God, the power in you must be real. You must be men of supernatural power. And you know, you cannot uh, terrify the devil by words that you get out of the dictionary. You cannot terrify the devil by Greek language. You know, there are many preachers, they come before the public, and all they are talking about is, well, uh, the Greek of uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 is this. Uh, the Greek does not terrify the devil. Hebrew does not terrify the devil. It is the power of the Holy Ghost in the life of the man of God that terrifies the devil. It is not by your, your frowning the face that can terrify witches and wizards. If you have really got the power, when they see you, they understand, they know that this is a man of supernatural power. They will stay clear of you. They'll just get out of the way for you to march on. If you're going to be used of God in church growth, you have to have the power of God in your life. Now, listen to me. I will not deceive you. To have the power of God, you have a price to pay. A price to pay. A price to pay. You must be a man that knows the promises of God. Because without the promises, the power will not come. Your faith must be solidly built on the promises of God. And you must know God. You must know God because God said, I talk with Moses face to face. You cannot get to that position if you are a casual person before the Lord. If you only see the Lord once a week, if you only come in with the Lord once a month, you cannot go to the position where God will say, I know Moses face to face. It's not like any other person. It's not like any other man. If you are going to be a man of supernatural power, you will know the Lord. Really know the Lord. Really know the Lord. And you'll be on bended knees most of the time. You know, even Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. When the devil saw him, they said, we know who thou art. Can they say that about you? When some people went to cast out devils from a man that had evil spirit, and he said, by the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, they said, wait right there. Jesus I know, Paul I know. Do the evil spirits know you as a terror to them, as fire for them? Do they know you as a man of supernatural power? Workers in this ministry, listen to me. If God is going to do what he wants to do, if God is going to do what you are saying he wants to do through you, you must be men of secret prayer, searching purity, and supernatural power. And that power will be in you to be able to declare the word of God forcefully, fearlessly, and faithfully. Then you must be men of strong persuasion. What does that mean? Men of strong persuasion. These are men who are fully persuaded about God, about their relationship with God, about who they are in Christ, they are strongly persuaded that not a devil, not a demon, not a man, not a woman can change them or sidetrack them. But you know, people who are not fully persuaded, even about their salvation, how can you work for the Lord? If you are not a man of strong persuasion, saying, I know whom I have believed. And I know I've committed my life into his son. And come what may, mountains may move, the sea may roar, and even the stars in heaven may fall. But I know I'm a child of God. And what I've committed into his son is able to keep on unto that day. If you are not a man of strong persuasion like that about your relationship with God, how can you ever be used of God? If today you are saying, well, I don't know whether I'm saved or not. I don't know whether God loves me or not. I don't know whether I'm with the Lord or not. If you are not a man of strong persuasion, forget it. You cannot be used of God in the way you are thinking. Not only that, 
you must be a man of strong persuasion on the authority of the Bible, the infallibility of the scripture. But you know, there are people who are not uh, very, very sure about the word of God. And when they go out and people confuse them and people say, well, after all, some men wrote the Bible, they don't know what answer to give. If you are not a man of strong persuasion concerning there is no error in the Bible, concerning the fact that the Bible is infallible, concerning the fact that the Bible is the word of God, having a strong, unshakable persuasion, concerning that you cannot be used of God, if you are handling that word with a double mind, if you are handling that word with an unsure, uncertain mind, you cannot be used of God. But you know the people that will say, I know that word, is the word of my heavenly father, and I'm strongly persuaded, listen to me, not only about your salvation, not only about, your, about the scriptures, but about the doctrines. You know, there are people that are not strongly persuaded concerning the doctrine of redemption, the doctrine of the atonement, the doctrine that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. And except you come through Jesus, you cannot see the Father. They say, well, uh, I about some people who have never heard, I about this, I about that. They are not strongly persuaded that Jesus Christ is the only way. Jesus is the only Savior before the Lord can use you. You must be a man of strong persuasion concerning the doctrines of the Bible. Listen to me. We found men and women who say that the Lord is using them. The doctrines they believed in 1981 is not the doctrine they believed in 1985. They are not men and women of strong persuasion. They preach the particular doctrine, sanctification, being purified, a second definite work of grace, years gone by. But today they say, well, uh, you cannot really be sure. Uh, really, you know, God works in various ways. He may get you saved and get you baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, maybe we really can never tell. I'm telling you this. If you are not a man of strong persuasion, a man that say, I know what I know, and I know it is based on the Bible. You must be saved, you must be sanctified, you must be baptized in the Holy Ghost, and your life must be straight before the Lord, because the Holy Ghost cannot come upon an unclean vessel. If you are not strongly persuaded in that, God cannot use you. If, uh, you know, uh, when you are called to preach in a... I'm sorry to mention churches, CAC Church, you just flew along with them. You cannot talk, because you are not a man of strong persuasion. When you are called to come to the Baptist church, you'll be talking of eternal security because you are not a man of strong persuasion. When you are called into the Pentecostal churches, you'll be rolling, and rolling with them, dancing with them, and uh, you, you are just a man that moves with the wind. You are not a man of strong persuasion. You will never be used of God. Listen to me. Did Moses change before Pharaoh? No. That was a man of strong persuasion. Because he said unto, unto Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is that God? You may not know him, but I know him. I'm a man of strong persuasion. The Caleb changed before the people that wanted to stone him with Joshua. Oh no, he was a man of strong persuasion. God has given us the land. They are like grasshoppers before us. We can overcome them. How about Joshua? When he came around Jericho, was he vacillating and, and uh, you know, halting between two opinions? Oh no, oh no. He was a man of strong persuasion. Tell me about Paul. When he came before Felix, or before Festus, or before Agrippa, and they challenged him, they questioned him as to the basis of his faith, when he reaches in of judgment, and of, and of holiness, and of the judgment to come, Felix trembled, and he said, I will listen to you next time. Paul was a man of strong persuasion. Any synagogue he went, any city he went, he declared that Jesus is the Christ. And if you are not a man of strong persuasion like that, you don't know what you believe, you don't know what you are standing for, you can never be used of God. If you are going to be used of God, anywhere you are, anywhere you go, you'll be settled. You'll know that this is what you believe. Now, you members of the ministry here, listen to me. You say you want God to use you. Well, you're a man or woman of strong persuasion. When he challenge you as to what you stand for, about your salvation, about restitution, about uh, no divorce and remarriage, and about polygamy. When they challenge you, do you recoil? Do you draw by? Do you say, well, uh, our preacher knows that. I don't know that yet, but our, uh, when we go to our church, our church doesn't want us to do it. There you are. Your church doesn't want you to do it. You don't use jewelry because your church doesn't want you to do it. 
You don't drink because your church doesn't want you to do it. And you don't do a particular thing. Oh, it's the church. It's our church. Which means if you are going to another church, you'll do another thing. But because we're in this church, you cannot do that. Are you a man? Are you a woman of strong persuasion? is not to me. Before God can depend upon you and give you the keys of the kingdom. And you see in a mighty way, you must be men and women of secret prayer, searching purity, supernatural power, strong persuasion, and scriptural preaching. Not telling tales, not telling stories, but scriptural preaching. And you can go through the New Testament. Anytime Peter opened his mouth, it was full of scripture. Stephen opened his mouth, it was full of scripture. Philip went to the man that was coming from Jerusalem, understandest thou what thou readest? And he began at that scripture and he preached unto him Jesus. And everywhere they went, they preached the word of God. God walking with them, confirming the word with signs following. And whenever Paul came, he opened the scriptures and he quoted from the scriptures and told the people that Jesus is the Christ. They were people of scriptural preaching. There were people that stayed with the scripture. What was the counseling of Paul, the apostle, to young Timothy when Paul was going away? This is it. I charge you before God, and I charge you before Jesus Christ, and I charge you before the angels of God, and I charge you in every way possible. Timothy, listen to me. Preach the word in season, out of season, because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will eat, they will hit to themselves. Men having uh, itching ears will hit to themselves, just teachers. Now you must be a man of scriptural preaching. Stay with the word, stand with the word, and earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That's Christianity. The faith once delivered unto the saints. If you are not a man of scriptural preaching like that, you'll never be able to get used of God in a mighty way. Then of a saintly purpose. What's your purpose? Why are you preaching? You know, I know men who are preaching because they are a failure in... Um, secular work and because they have failed in secular work they feel well i'm an evangelist so they reach out and they're preaching no call no understanding no certainty they just reach out like that and you know they fall by the wayside but if you have a purpose like jesus christ from the time jesus christ was born he knew that he was for calvary he was headed towards calvary Paul the Apostle, Agabus came in Acts of the Apostles. And when, they, when Agabus came, he tied himself with the belt of the girdle of Paul. And he said, so shall they bind this man that has this girdle. And the people there, they were weeping. And uh, Paul said, what mean ye to weep and to break my heart? I'm not only ready to suffer in Jerusalem, I'm willing to die in Jerusalem because I'm a debtor. He told the Romans, I'm a debtor, I must preach the gospel to the wise and to the unwise, to the barbarians as well. Woe is me, he said in First Corinthians, if I preach not the gospel. Those are the people, they are not preaching for money. They are not preaching for popularity. They are not preaching because uh, men want them to preach. They are not preaching because their wives are saying, Oh yes, my husband, I, I, I prayed, I consecrated myself to the Lord. And I said, I'm going to marry a preacher. So if you really want us to enjoy the marriage, keep on preaching. They are not uh, sisters preacher, mommy's preacher. They are people that are convinced that the purpose and the goal of their life is to preach the gospel. If it's in the wilderness, they'll preach it. If it's in the city, they'll preach it. Anywhere they go, they'll preach it. And the very last breath coming from them will, uh, will just uh, stop as they're preaching the gospel. It is when you are a man of a saintly purpose like that, not of a secular purpose, not because you want money, not because you want fame, not because you want anything, but because God has called you and you have set your face as a flint to go to the place where God wants you to go. That is a man of saintly purpose. And the Lord will be able to use such an individual. Will be men of spiritual perception. You know, you cannot carry on a church. You cannot carry on in, the, in a growing church if you do not have spiritual perception. Because people like Ananas and Sapphira will come. And it is only spiritual perception that will make you to say, Why has Satan filled your heart? Many people will come, they will say they believe, but you know, a spiritual perception that will make you to know whether they are sincere or they are not sincere. Many people will come to tempt you and to question you. It's only spiritual perception that will make you to know whether they are for God or they are for Satan. 
if you are going to get involved in a growing church, you must be men of spiritual perception. You will know when to sow, where to sow, what to do. And the Lord will be giving uh, the fruit, the benefits. Now, you must be men of sound principles, principles of living. You know, there are men that do not have any principles. They just uh, do as they like, as the occasion serves. But we're told in Romans chapter 12, verse 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. That's the principle. Honesty everywhere. In your spiritual life, in your private life, in your public life, everywhere you go, honesty. Now, if you don't have a such scriptural, sound principles of living, you will never amount to any, anything in the sight of God. But you must have sound principles. Let me ask you, where do you stand? Is your claim and your desire to be used of God just an idle desire, an idle claim? I've just told you, if you are going to be used of God, there must be secret praying, searching purity, supernatural power, a strong persuasion, scriptural preaching, saintly purpose, spiritual perception, and sound principles. If these things are there in your life, you're on the way to being used of God in a mighty way. If they are not there, you have a chance to get on your knees, to get before your face, before the Lord. Call upon the Lord. This is no time to sleep. This is not no time to be idle. This is a time to check up and to seek the face of the Lord. And the Lord can make you who you ought to be. Rise up and let us pray. Are you weighed in the balances and found wanting? Are you equal to the task? Are you just playing church? Cajoling yourself, deceiving yourself? Do you have these qualities, spiritual qualities in your life? God is no respecter of persons. If you want to be used of God, this is your chance. This is your time. Call upon the Lord. Church politics will not get you to be used of God. It's not politics, it's power. Lay bear your heart before the Lord. Be sincere, be open, be frank. And tell the Lord where you are, what you are doing, the state and the condition of your heart. You tell the Lord. He wants to use you. God cannot go along with those who are indifferent, those who do not care, those who are not serious. If you want to be used of God, you must call upon Him. In a growing church, God needs people of secret praying, people of searching purity and spiritual power. Where do you stand? 